Failure is what people feel when they don't follow through on what they set out to do. They don't show up for that five minutes of repeating their affirmations and you know, feeling their new life. They don't show up for whatever self-care they've committed to. And then that failure story stops them in their tracks. When failure is really about what else do I need to learn about this? You know, if this isn't working, clearly there's either something else to do or I need to move in a different direction. I mean, it's really a guidepost. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Has there ever been a time in your healing journey, maybe even right now, that you thought it was your fault that you were sick? Or have you felt like there just isn't enough time to finally focus on you, whether it was resting or even making healthy meals for yourself? Or maybe there was a pervasive thought that kept entering your mind that you didn't deserve to get better. I have personally struggled with each of these stories and many others when I was stuck in my chronic fatigue loop even my chronic migraine loop when I was younger. Like so many women, I kept trying to struggle through it, spinning my wheels. When I was at my worst and literally did not know where to turn over 40 years ago, the question that I knew I needed to answer for myself was, so how did I get to be so sick in my late 20s and early 30s? Was I destined to be broken for the rest of my adult life? And it finally hit me. After falling back on the floor over and over again, so tired, thinking I was never going to get my energy back, I realized that I was holding tightly to a powerful, disempowering belief that I learned as a little girl. See, growing up, I believed that my worth as a woman was measured by how much I was able to do for other people. So I worked as hard from as early as I can remember. I was determined to prove my worth through hard work, serving others, and adding more to my plate. And at some point, that plate became so massive and unmanageable, yet I still found myself stressing and worrying about not doing enough for other people. I was convinced that self-care was selfish and most importantly, self-indulgent. I remember calling my workouts at the gym my selfish hour because that's how powerful and disempowering my mindset was for most of my life. And I was not myself anymore. At that time, I felt like I was a robot simply going through the motions. I had no energy reserves to show up for the people that mattered most to me. Now, women like myself often feel guilt and shame about taking time out for ourselves. And that's where we get in trouble. Have you ever, ever felt guilty for taking time out for yourself? I learned the hard way that self-care is not selfish. It is not self-indulgent. It's the ultimate sign of self-respect. It's a non-negotiable. We often feel the need to get permission to love ourselves and to treat ourselves with respect. But I want to ask, whose permission are we waiting for? If you've ever felt guilty about taking care of yourself or focusing on the self-care, I want you to take a moment right now and say to yourself, I am worthy of being healthy. I am ready to say yes to me. Actually, I want us to just take a moment because this can be so powerful. And I want you to sit there for a second and say to yourself, even if you don't believe it yet, I want you to say to yourself, I am ready to say yes to me. See, the biggest way we limit ourselves is that we take care of everybody else first. And we always put ourselves last. And the only way to shift the priority is to shift our belief in how we feel about ourselves. You don't have to go on believing those stories that you were taught or the stories that you heard. You get to decide today. It's time to shift that belief and decide that you are worthy and deserving because you deserve a body that simply works for you. And that is exactly the conversation that Dr. Karen Shanks and I are going to be having today. Dr. Karen Shanks is going to dive even deeper and share five of the most powerful stories that continue to loop in our minds and halt our ability to heal. And before I bring her on, I want to quickly share an essential oil blend that has really supported me and helped me 
really focus on a state of emotional healing and honestly, overall healing. This is the blend that made a massive impact on me when I was healing with my autoimmune condition over the last two years. And it's a blend I've shared often on the podcast, but probably not in a while. And it's my Superwoman blend. I consider this a self-love blend. And I wanted to just share it with you on here again because it's worth repeating. So I'm gonna share the recipe really quickly and then I'm gonna share where to go and find it in case you wanna see an image of it. So in a little 10 mil roller, you're going to take two drops of clary sage, 10 drops of lavender, five drops of cedarwood, five drops of geranium, and four drops of a lang And if you're feeling extra in the self-love mode, a couple drops of rose and jasmine too. You're gonna put all those oil drops into a 10 mil roller, fill it up with your favorite carrier oil of choice, fractionated coconut oil, grapeseed oil, almond oil, whatever fits for you. And then you're gonna apply this roller, this beautiful superwoman blend on your wrists, on your temples, on your neck, wherever feels good for you so that you are feeling that abundance, that self-love, all the goodies that come from this beautiful blend. You can get in that zone of genius of true healing and emotional support. Now, if you do want an image of the blend and the recipe, you can absolutely find it on my Instagram feed. I even actually have it in my Instagram highlights, a whole thing on the Superwoman blend and how to make it and what it does, all the goodies there. My handle for Instagram is at Dr. Marisa, that's D-R-M-A-R-I-Z-A. And you can find a lot of my other amazing blends as well. I absolutely, I have a self-love blend. I have emotional release blend. These are two of my absolute favorites that have been just mainstays for me and my healing journey. And I wanted to just be able to share those with you as well. Well, now that you've got some really beautiful resources and you got access to some of those gorgeous blends of mine, I want to take a moment and celebrate you. See, every day I hear from new listeners who are recommended by you. Thank you so much. One such listener is Carmen Valencia. She reached out to me on Instagram just a couple of weeks ago, give or take, and here is what Carmen had to say. For too long, even though so many healthy things sounded good, I honestly thought they wouldn't work for me. I had pretty much given up. But after hearing your mom's story, she sounded just like me. She was even Latina, and that hit home for me. I wanted to not be so tired anymore. So last November, I decided to do your detox after hearing one of your episodes and hearing about your mama. I know your mom's success and I thought I could have it too. So I decided to do it and whoa, it worked for me. I dropped 10 pounds, I had no more hot flashes and I'm not so tired and anxious before going to bed. I'm actually doing it again with two of my best friends because they saw such a difference in me I can't wait to spread the word. Thank you to you and your mom. Well, thank you so much for sharing your epic win, Carmen. Wow, what a story. I am so excited to shout you out today. And I am so happy that you're not only feeling great, but you are helping other women to feel great too. That's so powerful. That is how we make the change in the world that we wanna see. If you're listening, Carmen, I would love to gift you a signed copy of my book, The EO Hormone Solution, with a little personal note from me. Just reach back out to me on Instagram at Dr. Marisa or wherever you want to plug into, and we will get that book sent out to you ASAP. Now, if you are listening, well, one, welcome to this interview. In case you were wondering about the program that Carmen was talking about, because I've had so many direct messages and Facebook messages about it over the last couple of weeks, We are actually starting a new live group and there is still tons of time to join. You've got about a week to join to be with me and hundreds of other amazing women, including my mom, my best friend Candace, and even my husband. Because yes, partners can do it too. Men can do it too. Brothers, I mean, men can do it too. How about that? Um, We will be officially starting together as a community on March 2nd, um, but you can start anytime. It's just fun and supportive to have a community cheering you on all the way. I know I like a community cheering me on all the way. I love my beautiful detox community. We will have a link for you to sign up in the show notes for episode 166, or you can just check it out at drmarisa.com slash detox. Over 2,000 women have joined me so far and they've experienced incredible results. I love hearing about the results all the time, just like Carmen, such a big win. And honestly, 
It's literally just 14 days. I'll tell you what, what I know about women is that we can do something good for our bodies and our hormones in 14 days. And man, those 14 days are transformational. So I hope you decide to join me. Now I wanna bring on Dr. Karen Shanks to this beautiful interview, but before I bring her on, I wanna quickly sing her praises. Dr. Karen Shanks is a physician, teacher, and author of Heal, a nine-stage roadmap to recovery, reversing chronic illness, and claiming the potential of your vibrant new you. Amazing book, by the way. During her 25 years of medical practice, she has helped thousands of clients with chronic illness to heal and regain their hope, their energy, and their life's potential. She is the founder and director of the Center of Medicine and Healing Arts in Iowa City, and she is sought out nationally as a healer for her clients and as a mentor by the Functional Medicine Practitioner Group. So let's bring on Dr. Karen Shanks. Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Dr. Karen Shanks. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much for asking. Yeah. We are talking about how the stories that we hold on to, especially our our health stories, really become a roadblock in creating true health. And I love that we're having this conversation. This is not a conversation that I've had most like specifically here on the show. It's been addressed a couple of times, but not to the extent of which we're going to dive into it today. What I want to first do before we kind of start to unpack the layers of this is I would love to hear a little bit about how this work came to be, how you were inspired to share this message. The message about stories in particular? Yeah. Well, your message in general, but that particular, like how you figured that out, like what was that aha moment for you where like, this is keeping people from their, their highest healing potential? Well, I think that the, I've had many aha moments, both in working with clients and working on myself and my own healing and realizing that so often the obstacles for me had to do with, oh, I can't seem to make myself a priority in my life. You know, I can't seem to give myself permission to, you know, create the space that I need for my own healing and put myself first once in a while. And I had to reckon with that in order to heal from my own issues. I have, you know, have had my own health issues over the years. But certainly with clients, you know, creating those savvy healing plans that seemed perfect and addressed their biochemical imbalances and the client wants those strategies, but then, you know, they just can't seem to make them work. So what stands in the way? And oftentimes it is, it's, it's, especially with women, not making themselves a priority or not feeling that they have um, a strong sense of personal power or agency over their own healing, how to choose the path what works for them and what doesn't because there's so much dogma out there about the right way to heal, the right way to go about healing in every camp, you know, in conventional medicine and functional medicine, people just, I think have become disenfranchised from their own healing and their own wisdom. And that's all about the stories that we've learned and that we tell ourselves and they get in the way of us finding the path that's best for us. We each have our own path. Oh, we absolutely do. What I love so much about what you were saying, you know, people reach out to us every single day. I'm sure you and so many of us as practitioners and they're looking for that right supplement and they're looking for the right testing and, and they're diving into, into those root causes of functional medicine, which I think is so incredible. But what we're talking about here is an intangible. And, you know, it's not like we can measure this. We can't put this on a lab, but it's the intangible that I think we are missing. So often I love, you know, one of my favorite books was by Candace Perth, which is Molecules of Emotion. It can be, although we're getting more clear on how to measure something like that, but there's a lot of intangible there. And when we're holding on to, again, a lack of worthiness, maybe this is my fault. You know, I am, I'm chained to this particular condition. I'm never going to get well. We, we're, we're not able to move forward in that journey. Are there, when it comes to, you know, listening particularly to women, this is a women's hormone podcast. And so my focus is a lot on women. What are some common stories that can get in the way of us healing a chronic condition or healing chronic fatigue or a hormonal imbalance that we're just not even seeing, that we are getting caught up in? 
Right. And, and that's a really good point. The last thing you say, we get caught up in it. We don't see it. And that's the issue. I think that's one of the tricky things about the stories we tell ourselves because essentially it's what we think, what we believe, what we believe we don't. It's like we sometimes lack the ability to step back as an observer and see that what we think and believe is a a story we've adapted. There is no ultimate, absolute, definable truth because we're filtering everything through our consciousness and through our perceptions as they are at any given time. You know, it's like as children, we take in the world around us and we don't have the capacity to make sense of it. So we create a lot of stories to explain what's going on. And, you know, as adults, we look back at that and those stories don't make sense that they did at the time. So it's a very subjective, tricky thing. But the in the book, I talk about five stories that I've observed in, at least in my population of clients that seem to come up again and again and again. And they, these are types of stories that have come up for me. And one has to do with power and a sense of agency and personal authority. We tend to hand ourselves over to the experts, the medical experts who know everything. And and that's, you know, that's sort of an attitude that's propagated by the institution of medicine, you know, and and any institution that is filled with experts who can often make us feel like we don't know what's best for us, but but they they do, that they know better. Right. So that's that's a story. That's a hundred percent a story. And and we've got to, you know, we have to upend that story, right? And reclaim our power and our personal agency. The other one is about worthiness. You know, am I worthy of my time to to buy healthy food and prepare special diets and go to the gym, go to yoga class? I get a babysitter for my children when I go and do what, you know, what it is that I need or get to go to bed early instead of doing the laundry. You know, these are the, the kinds of things I hear from my clients is I, I can't take care of myself because I get home from my, you know, my eight hours at work and pick up the kids and I've got to fix the dinner and I've got to do the laundry and blah, 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 you know, you know, they don't factor themselves in. That's a worthiness story. Hmm. You know, I want to just take a moment. It was, and I've shared this on, on the show before I had very severe chronic fatigue when I was 30 years old and I kept, I was doing all the things I thought I was taking care of the nutrients. I was drinking my green smoothies. I was even doing yoga. I was like checking the boxes in terms of, okay, what does one need to do? But I kept falling back on the ground. I kept, I kept getting back to square one and I just couldn't figure out what I was doing. And ultimately it was this, it was this defining limiting belief that I was brought up by my family, especially the women in my family, that it was selfish to to focus on me. I always need to put other people first. And so I just kept finding myself in this spiral over and over and over again until I finally had this moment where I realized, oh my gosh, I am I'm I'm locked into this belief that was literally drilled into me for as early as I can remember. Absolutely. And those are huge, those cultural stories that are passed. They're in our culture. They're in our family. They're so pervasive. They're so tenacious. They're hard to see. So that it's it's fantastic that you were able to recognize that. And I imagine you still bump up against it from time to time. And I think that's something to also acknowledge is that it's important to kind of look at that and say, okay, I see you. You're not serving me. And I'm going to push you to the wayside, but if I'm not mindful and I'm not always just kind of reminding myself, you know, you can so easy fall back because my family hasn't changed their belief around that, you know? And so anytime I'm around them, that is the underlying, the undercurrent. It hasn't gone away. Um, But, you know, my really being diligent around that, you know, letting that belief go and, and creating a new belief, a new story. But you're right. It absolutely, it's always just kind of like, you know, over there. And I think that's something to, to really acknowledge is that even if we address it and we decide that it's not the story that's serving us, it's not like it's, it, it's probably going to potentially pop back up a couple of times of course, in our life. It, it's, yeah. they've, they've created these deep grooves through our minds, deep mind pathways. And, you know, our work is to be aware, become the observer, and then 
uh, develop new grooves, new deep mind pathways, right? And over time, the, uh, this shift, this shift in that balance occurs. So we become more, we can live that new story more fully. But you're right, especially when we're tired and the path of least resistance is just to go down those old pathways. And what you said about your family brings up what I can, what I write about in my book as the third story, and that is about belonging because we share so many lifestyle habits and characteristics with our tribes and with our people and our communities. And to step out of that, to do something different that we think we need is a very threatening, scary thing to do. Even if you just decide to eat differently, so you're no longer going to eat the same things everyone else does at Thanksgiving, you know, or you're not going to eat the same thing that everybody loves at supper time. I mean, it's very hard. It's it's really hard. It is. I've transformed a lot of my family over the years. And mm -hmm. there was a holiday, a Thanksgiving, I want to say three years ago, where my mom let just let my husband and I, we took over Thanksgiving. And she was super excited because she's always known that this food is so healing. And she's she's really for the most part, change the way she eats until she kind of falls off track. But we took over Thanksgiving and we were making sauteed spinach and kale, big salads. We had sweet potatoes. And my sister comes out and she was just like, oh, uh, -uh this is not. So she took my grandfather to Marie Callender's and they brought back. <laughs> and she was like, we are, I'm going to go buy Thanksgiving over here. She brought back gravy and mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, and cause she was like, I'm not having this Thanksgiving. I'm not doing right, this. Right. I'm not, I'm not letting you subject everyone to this healthy Thanksgiving. And it literally went in and, and sabotaged our our entire yeah. affair. So that's yes. how that's how serious it can get. Yes. Sometimes. Yes. And we we are wired to belong. We're wired to belong and so it takes a lot of strength to to stand apart and make different choices. It so really is. I think that's huge. Gosh, it sounds like how can we ever heal with all these huge stories, right? Right. And so, like you said, I think that that those deep grooves, right, that continue to get perpetuated. I think also in the state of belonging, when we are, let's say we're dealing with a chronic autoimmune condition, maybe it's lupus or maybe it's endo, and we find a support group to support us. Sometimes it's it's as if we're we're stuck in that state that there may be no way out of that as well. And we, and there's a belonging that happens when we're in a group like that too, that can absolutely continue to perpetuate that illness. And I see that in support groups all over and not to say that they're not helpful, but there you can sometimes get stuck in that. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. People love to bond through adversity. It, you know, and there, these are things that are part of the human psyche and the human brain, the whole negativity bias of the brain. We are attracted to negative stuff and we're attracted to others who share our pain. But then how do we like elevate ourselves out of that pain when we're, you know, we have those bonds that are so powerful and you serve a purpose to up to a, a certain, a certain point. point. Yeah, yeah, I agree yeah. 100%. So that's a, that's an, a really excellent point. And then there's just the whole fear of change and uncertainty, which I consider that to be a whole nother category of stories although these are all inner these interrelate profoundly it's just kind of my way of thinking through the kinds of stories that we tell ourselves that it can end up sabotaging our efforts to heal but you know it's human to fear change it's human to fear an unknown future an unknown outcome what's going to happen if we become well i mean that is the, um, that's a literal fear that people have if i become well what do I lose? Will people still love me? Will my friends still want to be with me? Will my, you know, other sick friends still want to be my friends? I mean, th this is stuff that really comes up frequently. Absolutely. I call those false positives. You know, that the things that we anchor in this, what, how, how is this story serving you? How is it that it's serving you in the world? You know, an example, which is not a healing example, but an example too is like, let's say I'm just not, I'm just not boyfriend material. I'm not husband material. And what is, what does that allow for you? Well, you don't, you know, you can just stay at home in your pajamas all the time. You don't have to go out, you know, like there, it, it's kind of in a way it creates, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it also allows you the excuse of not really going out and, and being your full self for somebody. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yes. And then the last one I talk about is the story of not having enough time. 
because that's so, that's so pervasive, right? It's my story. It's, <laughs> it is pervasive in me. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's a, it's a choice, right? If we don't have enough time, it's not that we don't have enough time. It's just that we've, we've created different priorities. So it's always an excuse. We can establish our priorities and maybe, you know, that some things that we've been advised to do or we, we have felt that would be good contributions to our healing path. Maybe they, you know, we do have to choose. We have to make choices. We can't do everything, right? It's hard to do everything. But it's always a choice and I feel, just feel like we need to own that. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, and it's not to some, not something I, I wanted to just admit it and kind of own it. It's definitely something I've worked on for many, many years. And I'm really mindful when I say it, you know, oh, I'm, I'm really busy right now, or I got so much going on right now, you know, health, although I will say, you know, health is, you know, when I look at my day as a whole, like today I had a 45 minute morning ritual and I, I think about how much health is ingrained into my life every single day. And it, it's probably a quarter of my day is my health routines and because it is a priority. It's a priority because I want I want to live in a thriving, abundant, healing body. You know, I want to live a thriving, abundant, healing life. However, it, it, that particular story can play out in so many ways in our lives. I um, mean, health being that easy thing. I mean, for me, it comes up for my readers and my listeners all the time. Is like I don't have time to make healthy dinners. I don't have time to get my massages. I don't have time to take care of me. Like it's the easiest excuse to come up with. Yes, it is. It is. And, and, and like you say, it's just, we just have to be my, mindful of it. And each day we're making a new set of choices. And, you know, to some extent, it's a luxury to be able to take a quarter of a day and focus it on self-care. I do the same thing. I mean, yes, hours. <laughs> and I realize that it's a luxury and that I don't have to work in a factory for 40 to 50 hours every week. You know, I'm very privileged. I have work I love. I have a comfortable life. And I get to manage myself in a way that keeps me really, really well. But there are always going to be inroads to what we want to achieve. And they can be small. And sometimes it's the small things, really, that pack the biggest punch and can lead to the most, you know, healing and freedom. You don't have to spend half to, you know, a quarter to a third of your day with healing rituals. You know, not everybody needs to do that in order to, to receive great benefit from what they're able to do. Absolutely. No, there are small choices that we can make every day that really can make a huge impact. And to me, some level of self-care, I think is a non-negotiable, you know, if we're constantly giving to everyone else and never, ever focusing on ourselves, I think that's where, I think that's what lands a lot of women in trouble in the first place. And so I, you know, for me that, that had happened, you know, 10 years ago and I was like, okay, I'm only 30. I this can't keep happening to me. Like, what do I got to do to make the changes to really show up in my relationships, to show up in my community, to do the work that I know that I was put on earth to do. And that just meant taking a little bit more care of me. I got diagnosed with an autoimmune condition in 2018 and it was another wake up call. And I was like, huh, okay. I see you. I, I see this. And this since then, I've been even more mindful. And that's why I'm taking a little bit more time than I even used to because I was like, okay, well, clearly I didn't take enough time because I somehow landed an autoimmune condition in the middle of all that. And so it was just, you know, you, you get cues from your body about what needs to be done. Absolutely. And some of us are called to do more. We're more, we're more like the canaries in the coal mine, you know, and it takes more care. I, I mean, I've always considered myself that way. I just require that much more care. But what I learned from it, I pass on to others. It all fits. It's just a beautiful cycle of things. I love, I love the distinguishing of the five stories. I think that, you know, as, as we're all listening to this show and listening to your wisdom, I, you know, you're checking those, I don't know, I'm checking, oh, that one comes up every now and again, or I'm still working through this one. How do we begin to cultivate a new healing story? Kind of owning the fact that we're maybe holding on to some of those other stories. What can we do in terms of evolving our brain, evolving that neuroplasticity to change up the tracks? Well, it's not hard. Yeah, I think this is I think this whole topic is very intimidating they pe to people. They think oh, neuroplasticity. Whoa, sciency. 
<laughs> you know, this is this is going to be really hard. What I try to convey in the book is that it's as simple as just saying you from your your exhaustion, your place of exhaustion and suffering, wherever it is you are, you just say yes. You start. That's where you start. Just say yes. Don't expect any more than that. And then, you know, whatever you have the energy and capacity to do, take up a little baby step. Take a few little baby steps. Ask somebody for some help. Follow your internal wisdom about what to do next. But, ju- but literally starting by saying yes is the most profound message that you can send to your brain and your being and to the, u- the universe that you're ready. Right? And that is, and that's a yes to healing. Like I a yes am, to healing. I'm ready for healing. A yes to healing for me. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it, it really is that simple. It's that simple. It's Could not we- rocket science. Dr. Karen Shanks, could we make Uh that like an affirmation every morning? Like we have a couple of affirmations, like I am healing, I am healthy, I am saying yes to a healthy body. Would it be, would it be kind of just that, that repetitive kind of repeating of just owning that, that yes moment for yourself? I think that's part of it. I love affirmations. I love to have people pair affirmations with a feeling so that, because I feel like feelings really connect us to present time. We can, we, we can get start to get there with a, a present tense affirmation. I am healed. I receive healing. What you know, something like that. But then conjure up an emotion that goes with it, and and you can choose that. You know, love, uh, joyousness, freedom. And I'll have people make a list of the of the emotions that they want to associate with their healing. You know, visualize the healing. I'll have people visualize what their healing life looks like, who's there, what visually, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What, you know, just kind of setting up the scene. And then what are the emotions associated with that healing life that you are imagining and feel those. And then that really connects it into present time. And I think that's where the money is in terms of uh, creating that neuroplasticity that we want, those new mind grooves. And then practice every day. Practice, practice, practice. If you have two minutes, it doesn't, you don't have to sit down for an hour in a, med, in a formal meditation ceremony. If you have that time, that's great, but not everybody does. A few minutes. You know, a couple deep breaths in the middle of the day with a, with an affirmation and a and a feeling that you've perhaps written down on a note card, and have had have handy. You know, I really do believe it's as simple as that. But then the consistency and showing up, continuing to show up and show up and show up. I really, I really love the noting of the consistency. Yes, and then also embracing what I am thinking is the sixth story. And when I write my book about stories, this will be the sixth story. That's the story of failure because failure is always a story and failure is what people feel when they don't follow through on what they set out to do. They don't show up for that five minutes of repeating their affirmations and, you know, feeling their new life. They don't show up for whatever self-care they've committed to. And then that failure story stops them in their tracks. When failure is really about what else do I need to learn about this? You know, if this isn't working, clearly there's either something else to do or I need to move in a different direction. I mean, it's really a guidepost, but we get into this mindset that we've screwed up and it's a shameful experience when that's not what failure is at all. So I feel like that's a, that's also key to walking this path of healing is realizing that when we screw up, it's really just, we're being shown a different way. Yeah. I always say I'm either winning or I'm learning. I'm winning or learning. Those are the, those are two options. Right. Exactly. And there's always so much to gain from those moments. It's just really redefining what that means because we all, we all do a lot of, so many people struggle with a fear of failure, especially in their health journey um, and what that may look like. And I, I love I love that you address that head on and and how we can actually transform that and look at that in a different way. Yeah, it's vital. Yes, it's vital because we're all going to fail. We have to. And in some ways, if we didn't, we would never. I like to think of it as 
it's the genius of the universe showing us exactly where we need to go as our unique beings, exactly where we need to go. You know, we do one person's food plan and can't follow through on it, can't do it. Well, it's not the right time or it's not the right food plan. Wow, what incredible feedback is that? Now we, we get to move on to the, you know, to the next idea. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about in just the evolution of my nutritional journey, you know, in discovering that you got to find a unique path for yourself. You know, I've tried all kinds of things over the years, you know, just figuring it out and also being, you know, an advocate for, for what that kind of nutrition journey could be about. But I, there was a lot of things that I have learned about my body that either just taught me doesn't work versus does. And it's, it's always been such a great learning experience, learning about what my body has assimilated to and what it's not willing to assimilate to. Absolutely. Yeah. The thing though, is that and I work primarily with people with chronic complex illness, often really sick people, people who've been, I would say, abused by the conventional medical system, abandoned, and they're suffering. And so suffering people tend not to be as resilient as you and I, you know, and so they need to be reminded over and over and over again about, you know, um, these stories that they brought with them from their that are part of the baggage of having been through the ringer and, and a part of suffering. They need to be reminded a lot about the value of failure and help them redefine what it actually is. That makes so much sense. Absolutely. Well, when you're stuck in that mode where nothing is working and you feel like you've been in a failed system, doctors not listening to you, or they've sent you down the wrong path and you felt dismissed and you felt put to the wayside. Absolutely. I mean, I so often, you know, it breaks my heart to see how often women have been put through the ringer of the system and are just, they just are, they're about to give up because they don't know what else to do. And yeah, it's around having a picture of what it could look like to be in a healthier state once again. That's right. That's right. Do you ever, Karen, when you're working with people, do you ever have them write out what it would look like for them to imagine themselves in that healing state and write out in detail what that life would look like? Would that ever be a part of an exercise that you would have? Absolutely. Many people come in with that. It's really easy for them. They know exactly where they want to go. They can tell me their goals. I, it's very clear they have a, a very vivid picture of and feeling of where it is they want to go. Other people don't. And part of it is, it, I think, been just sort of beaten out of them. It's just drained from their beings. They can't see it. They just know suffering and they know dead ends, you know, and they know failures. And absolutely, I will push them. I'll have them do it right in front of me if we have to, because we can't start our work until this door opens, (laughs) you know, until they open the door to their healing. And I think that can be a very powerful way. Writing, I think, can be a very powerful way to do that. Everyone aligns with different kind of modalities in which to create. Sometimes it is like literally closing our eyes in a meditative state and visualizing even even our organ systems and how beautifully they're functioning, maybe our mitochondria and how beautifully they're functioning. They're just cranking energy for us in an efficient way. Or it's just imagining the life that we have with our family and how we're feeling. Maybe, maybe we're 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 J Lo on the on the halftime show. Yeah. At 15 yeah, years old. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Just imagining what that would look like. I know my mom, when she was in her late forties had never run a, a, tr- a real race and like a real run. And, you know, she really imagined, she imagined herself. She was really struggling with menopause and she was struggling with a lot of symptoms. And as she started to turn the corner in that, she really imagined something bigger. She's like, I can see myself running these races. I can see myself being strong enough, fast enough, agile enough to do it. And she's now ran, I think, well over 75 races since then. And she just ran one the other day and she sent us a picture. She's like, no filter. She looks gorgeous. I, this is post-race. Like, you know, one, it's amazing. I was like, look at you with your little J-Lo look, you know, running your half marathon. And it just, you know, it, she kind of envisioned that and then it became who she was. I love to paint that picture of what's possible when we can see ourselves in it. Absolutely. And that's easier for some people than others. It's true. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So true. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember when I was diagnosed with my autoimmune condition and I, 
it really took me aback. I was taken aback. I was surprised. I was like, oh my gosh, as a, a women's hormone practitioner, this was definitely, I didn't see this coming. And I remember sitting in with it and, you know, and just really imagining what it would feel like to really, my body is working for me. It is, it is fully functional and, you know, what it looked like for my immune system to be just with an ease and grace and not hyperactive and firing the way that it was. Then I, once I saw it, I could feel it. I could envision it. I started doing the action steps to get there. And I've been in remission for nine months, completely in Hajimoto's remission and feel phenomenal. But in that first couple of months, it is, it's, it's a blow to the system to think, you know, all those beliefs come back up like, oh my gosh, what have I done? What, you know, da, 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 da. you know, your mind is racing with, 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 oh my gosh, have I failed myself, you know, and, and having to step outside of that, knowing that that isn't serving because I definitely wasn't feeling better in those moments and in those feelings and just kind of trying to imagine like, okay, like how can, what does it look like to feel in this other state? And you're absolutely right. Like it's, it's one thing for to be empowered with this information and, and kind of understand the, the possibility of transformation in your mind and then what that creates for you physically. And it's a very different scenario when someone has been told and told and told and told that they're simply going to have to live with this for the rest of their life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I, I really like to have people work with the idea that they're not broken. If you have if you're diagnosed with Hashimoto's or you're diagnosed with and I think especially with autoimmune disorders, people get that have this image of they're being attacked by their own body. And I try to get them to work with how they're not broken. Your body is doing exactly what it was designed to do under the circumstances that it's in. And it's our job to figure out what are those sets of circumstances that have led to this, what's going on today. Absolutely. That's so empowering to know because people really feel like they're just broken and it's not a meaningful, their illness isn't a meaningful outcome of a collision between their genetics and the environment, which is how I look at illness as in functional medicine. That's how we look at what illness is all about. Therefore, we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, you know? absolutely. We have, we have the power to figure that out and to change that. Well, I just want to say this is such a powerful conversation. And I think it opens the door to that, that intangible path that can really lead us towards true healing. Easier said than done. And I recognize that. And, and you know, and you in living that every single day, recognize it as well. I know that your book does such a marvelous job at mapping out a real pathway for us. If someone's saying, if someone's taking that step, if you're taking that step, you're listening right now and you're saying, you know what? Yes. Yes. I, I want this. This feels this feels right. I connect to what Dr. Karen is saying. Where is the book? And tell us a little bit about what are some of the other attributes of this book that you bring to the table? I actually was, over the years, I was sort of pushed and coerced by my clients to create a guidebook that allowed them to, to, to have a view, like a bird's eye view of the terrain of their healing. What are what are all these pieces? What are all the key aspects? of our humanness and how our bodies function that plays into our well-being and our energy and our ability to be well. And, you know, there are many very excellent books out there on healing and usually, but usually they're very niched, you know, they're very, they address one small aspect of healing. And it's so important for people, especially when there's a lot going on to see the whole, the whole picture. And then, to feel supported and learning to trust their intuitive wisdom about what they personally need so that they can jump in to their personal hotspots and get to work. So I, I, I developed that roadmap. I call it the nine domains of healing. The book is filled with exercises and meditations and permission slips because I feel like we, we need that kind of support at, no, no matter what aspect of our healing we're working on. And I tried to make it very approachable and accessible and like a true handbook that you can open and you can scribble all over the margins and really put some practical tools to use in your everyday life. So it's called Heal, a nine-stage roadmap to recover energy, reverse chronic illness, and claim the potential of a vibrant new you. I love it. And it's available on Amazon. People can read more about it on my website, karenshanksmd.com slash heal. 
or that you can go to Amazon and take a look at my book page, Erin Shanks, MD Heal. Well, we are going to have it inside the show notes for this episode. So we can link directly, not only to the site, but also to Amazon directly. So if you are ready to jump in and, and literally get that full picture, you're ready to start to visualize and then start to create health and wellness. This is the book to do it. Dr. Karen Shank, thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing your incredible wisdom. Thank you for inviting me, Ray. I enjoyed it. Thank you. So I want to know. Could you relate to one or two of the five stories that Dr. Karen shared today? The stories that we've been telling ourselves can be so powerful, so powerful in fact that they can get us stuck, unable to move forward to get the healing that we truly deserve. I think it's really time for us to say yes to ourselves, for you to say yes to you. And that is why I'm so excited to share Dr. Karen's book with you today, Heal a nine-stage roadmap to recovering energy, reverse chronic illness, and claim the potential of your vibrant new you. It is worth getting your hands on and to see how she lays out the nine stages of healing for your body. Now, the link for the book and her book website will be in the show notes for episode 166. And if you are ready to say yes and join me and hundreds of other incredible women to take that first step to finally crushing your cravings, increasing that energy, dropping that stubborn belly fat, and experiencing powerful results by repairing your gut, your liver, and your hormones, the link for my gentle and easy 14-day hormone detox will also be in the show notes for episode 166, or you can just go to drmarisa.com slash detox. All the details will be there. And I can't wait to hopefully see you in the beautiful detox community where we get to cheer you on and usher in a brand new March. I'm so excited about that. Now, thank you so much for stopping by and listening into the Essentially You podcast. On this next episode coming up, I am jumping back in. It's a solo episode. How to naturally reverse estrogen dominance, especially during perimenopause, because ooh, that is when it comes on full tilt. This episode has taken me some time to create and it's pure fire. I am so excited to share this with you. You are not gonna wanna miss out on it. I'm gonna be laying out the full game plan because so many of us are dealing with estrogen dominance and we are being tossed aside or recommended birth control pills instead of actually addressing the root cause. So until then, I hope you're having an amazing day. I can't wait to see you on the next episode. 